Okay, today we'll continue uh, covering branch handling and we'll focus on branch prediction. I'm not sure if we'll be able to finish all of branch handling today. But this is actually a topic that has fascinated many, many people. And it still continues to fascinate many people, although not as, not as many as before. Oh, wait, how did this move? <laughs> that was good news for you. I don't know if it's good news, but we'll see. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about why it's so fascinating and why it's a very difficult problem in computer architecture. But before that, I have good news for you, hopefully. We'll see if you think it's good news. But starting from Wednesday, uh, we'll go to a different room Perfect. since you've complained for the rest of the semester, unless there's some issue with scheduling that room. Uh, this is in CIC. It's the Panther Hollow Room on the fourth floor. If you've never been there, have you been to CIC? I think I've asked this question before. OK, you can click on this link and figure out where CIC is, first of all. And if you take the elevators, uh, when you enter the building and go up to the fourth floor, you'll see uh, doors, uh, glass doors, big glass doors that lead you to Intel Science and Technology Center. That's where my office is also, actually. If you turn left after you enter those doors and go straight, you'll hit the big Panther Hollow Room, which is the conference room. And it's much bigger than this, and it's hopefully more comfortable. And ho yeah, hopefully more temperate. <laughs> yeah, air conditioned, that's right. There's no air conditioning here? There's only something. Heating. It's only heating. Oh, it's only heating? Wow. That's Pittsburgh. I, I would think Pittsburgh would, would require cooling, too. But oh, it's one of the. Oh, I see. You cannot switch. That's right. Some, some rooms, I guess some, some old buildings cannot switch, right? All right. But this is where we will be on Wednesday. So if you're here on Wednesday, you would be in the wrong room, unless you want to be here. <laughs> is this good news for everyone? Yes. OK. I guess it looks like. Nobody contests this one. OK, readings. I hope you're doing these readings. I'll keep flashing these until you keep doing these, I guess, although I cannot force you to do it. <laughs> but you'll benefit from it, especially if you've done this reading for today. Combining branch predictors, you'll get a lot more out of this lecture. And as I said, uh, this is not the time to do this reading yet, but do this reading first. And then this will put a lot of things together. And I'll add one more. I'll keep adding one more. We'll, we'll cover precise exceptions either uh, next, in the next lecture or the next next lecture. So this is a paper that talks about different methods that we will cover in class. It's a good paper. It's a seminal paper that was originally published in International Symposium on Computer Architecture in 1985. So it's about 30 years old now. Not that old, right? Given that the microcoded machines paper was in 1951, that's, that's about 63 years. Is it 63? Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> OK. So we're continu we're c we'll continue control dependence handling, as I said. And uh, there are several options we've talked about. And we stopped at delayed branching, although you know the idea by now, because I've kind of teased you earlier in one of the earlier lectures. But basically, the idea is simple. Uh, you change the semantics of a branch instruction such that it takes effect after n instructions. Basically, the next n instructions that come after the branch are in, the, in what's called the delay slot, and they're always executed regardless of what direction the branch takes. You could also make it based on cycles, but usually the ISA is specified as in n instructions, and usually n is 1. Uh, basically, this delays the execution of a branch. n instructions that are in the delay slots that come after the branch are always executed. The key question is, how do you find instructions to fill these delay slots, right? Well, what, what is the benefit of this? The benefit of this is now you don't need to predict where the branch goes, right? If you can fill the pipeline with these delay slot instructions, you know that you're going to execute these instructions. There's no control dependence problem anymore, if you will. It's kind of nice in that sense. But we'll see the downsides of the idea. Well, one downside is, how do you find these instructions? Where do they come from? Uh, certainly, the branch must be independent of the delay slot instructions, right? You cannot put the delay slot instruction after the branch if the branch depends on that instruction. Uh, for an unconditional branch, it's easier to find instructions to fill the delay slot. And I'll show you. Well, I won't show you examples with an unconditional branch, but you can think of it, right? You basically take the instructions and the targets and pull them into the delay slots because you're going to branch always anyway. For a conditional branch, which is the more difficult branch to predict, as we've discussed, now, condition computation should not depend on instructions in the delay slots. Because of this, and because you're conditionally going somewhere, it's difficult to fill the delay slot. 
it's difficult to find an instruction that is for sure executed regardless of which direction the branch is taken. Well, let me give you uh, one example of why this is beneficial first. These are instructions A, B, C. There, there are some instructions, and these are dependencies between instructions, and this is the branch conditional X. Basically, this branch instruction conditionally jumps to X, otherwise falls through. And then you have instructions D, E, F, and G. Assume that you have a two-stage pipeline, instruction fetch and execute. I've simplified the pipeline a lot, uh, because uh, I'm going to assume a delay slot of 1. This is normal code without any delay slots. What happens? Basically, you fetch A in the next cycle. You execute A, fetch B, and you're done with A. And then in the next cycle, you execute B, fetch C, dot, 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 right? And when the branch is fetched, assuming you're not doing any prediction, basically, there is a bubble in the pipeline, right? You don't know what to fetch until the branch is executed, and then you fetch G, assuming the branch is taken here. So it takes actually six cycles to go through all of this code assuming you stop at G. Now, if you have delayed branch, uh, this is one way of generating the code. Basically, you have instructions A, B, C, and branch conditional. This instruction B over here uh, does not contribute to the branch computation, right? which means that it's independent of the branch, or the branch is independent of it, which means that we can actually move this to the delay slot. Right? Does that make sense? We cannot move A and C because A and C have to be executed before the branch. They cannot come after the branch, but we can move B at the delay slot. And delay slot is the instruction that comes right after the branch. This is going to be always executed regardless of which direction branch this branch conditional goes. So let's take a look at the timeline of execution. Now in the first cycle, A is fetched. In the second cycle, A is executed, C is fetched. In the next cycle, C is executed, branch conditional is fetched. And because we employ delayed branching, we're not going to do any prediction. In the next cycle, when branch is being executed, B is fetched, and it's going to be executed, regardless of which direction branch goes. In the next cycle, branch condition is determined and branch is taken. So B is executed, and the fetch engine is redirected to G, and the G is fetched. Now it's five cycles to execute all of these instructions. So you've actually improved performance by 16.67%, right? Even, even in a two-stage pipeline. OK, so that's the idea. It's kind of nice. Well, how do you fill the delay slot? In this case, you had this instruction. But what if you didn't have any independent instruction? You have a problem, right? And that's exactly the problem a lot of compilers have had uh, for filling this delay slot. And if you cannot fill this delay slot, what do you insert there? If this B was actually also contributing to the computation, no op, yeah. That's the, that's the best answer. <laughs> you put a no op. Or you exchange a register with itself, <laughs> which is a no op, effectively. OK. So uh, people have actually tried to fix this problem, filling the delay slot problem. And they've introduced fancy delayed branching, what I like to call. Basically, the idea in Spark, for example, Spark is one of the ISAs uh, that, um, uh, that has delayed branching. MIPS is another one. Uh, so in Spark, if the branch falls through, if it's not taken, the delay slot instruction is not executed. So you change the semantics of the delay slot a little bit. If the branch is taken, the delay slot is executed. If the branch is not taken, the delay slot instruction is not executed. Why could this help? Because you can absorb the instruction from where you're branching to. Into the That's right. Yes. And where is this, where is this useful? Yeah, like what kind of constructs, what kind of program constructs this is useful for? If else. Yeah. If else, maybe, but loops, right? Okay. Yeah, if you're looping through and loop is usually taken, then you can actually do this nicely. So let's take a look at a loop, for example, here. It could be useful in if else too, uh, depending on the frequencies. But if you look at this loop, assume that uh, this is the scenario where you cannot actually move ABC. Uh, uh, a, B, C, they, they're all dependent on each other, and eventually branch is dependent on the result. This is our normal code, and branch is actually going to this loop. So this is a basically a loop. In the loop, you, loop body, you execute A, B, C, and branch conditional, and then you keep doing that for a while. Now, if you have delayed branch, not the fancy one, the old, old school, non-fancy delayed branch code, there's no instruction to fill this delay slot. Right? So you put an op. You have to put an op. Because if the branch goes this way, you would need to execute either ABC. 
if the branch falls through, you need to execute D. Well, you cannot do both. With fancy delayed branching, which is delayed branch with squashing, the idea is this. Basically, if the branch is taken, you're going to execute A. If the branch is not taken, you're going to execute D. But if the branch is not taken, if the branch falls through, the delay starts the instructions that execute it. And observing that many of the loop branches are taken, because programs consist of loops that iterate many, many times, this idea is probably a good idea, because now what you can do is you can move one instruction from the next iteration of the loop to the delay slot. And if the branch is taken, which means that you go to the next iteration, you execute the instruction from the next iteration. If the branch is not taken, this becomes a no-op. It gets, it gets squashed. That's exactly the effect what you want right, in a loop. And this has actually improved the ability of the compiler to fill the delay slot much better. Does that make sense? Basically, this is the first iteration, and this, is, this A is from the next iteration, and then you jump to B. Yes? But how do you know if the branch is not taken um, before you execute it? Yeah, you need to execute. So that's the, it's not as beautiful anymore, right? Once you execute it, you need to flush again. So you need to have that flushing capability in the pipeline. Absolutely. So the hardware is not as simple. <laughs> but it's always a trade-off again. If, if you want full control in the software level while making the hardware simple, you'll, not, you'll have to live with the no-ops. If you want to get rid of no-ops, you need some hardware support. This is one example of that, yes? Is this really actually any different than a branch predictor that knows that a branch backwards will, or assumes that it will always be taken? Um. That's a good question. It's actually similar in, in some sense, right? right. It, it seems yeah. to be doing the same thing, except now uh -huh. you have an additional instruction. That's right, except you're not doing it in hardware. You're purely doing it in software. Yes. I mean, but you're still given the, the instruction that allows you to do this, so it seems weird that you're That's right. given an instruction instead uh -huh. of it just happening. That's right. It's, uh, it's different in the sense that the hardware doesn't need to predict. But yes, it, it's, it's, it's blurring the lines right now. <laughs> OK. So what are the advantages of this? I guess I'll give you, since I have 100 slides to cover, and we're only one-tenth of the way. <laughs> I'm not going to cover all of that. I'm joking. But you keep the pipeline full. I think we've already talked, this, talked about this. You keep the pipeline full with useful instructions in a simple way. right? Assuming that the number of delay slots is equal to number of instructions to keep the pipeline full before the branch resolves. So this was nice with one delay slot. But that works for only a two-stage pipeline, where the branches are resolved in the second stage. right? What if you have a 20-stage pipeline? Do we have 19 delay slots? Mm. It's already difficult to fill the delay slot with one instruction. right? How about 19? That's going to be tough. So now you see the downside of the idea, right? You need something else on top of this, so this is not a solution. All delay slots can be filled with useful instructions. Well, basically, these are coupled, kind of, right? Because if you, the number of delay slots increases, this becomes exacerbated, OK? If you cannot fill the delay slot with useful instructions, then you're executing no ops. Uh, well, I guess <laughs> I've talked about the disadvantages under advantages, but this is an advantage, actually. <laughs> Assuming you can make this work. Disadvantages, well, not easy to fill the delay slots, even with a two-stage pipeline. Uh, and the number of delay slots actually increased with pipeline depth and superscalar execution width. Right? And we'll talk about that uh, again later today. And also, the number of delay slots should be variable with variable latency operations. So some operations may take eight cycles. Some operations may take 100 cycles. And your branch may be dependent on them. And if you have buffering capability in your pipeline, you may need to fetch more instructions, depending on which instructions the branch is dependent on. Does that make sense? This may not make sense right now, because we haven't seen pipelines with buffering capability like that. But out of execution machines have this ability. So keep this in mind right now. Basically, the resolution latency of a branch is not constant, depending on what operations the branch is dependent on. Think about a data flow machine where instructions are executed based on when the data is available. The branch, although well, branch and data flow machine is kind of odd, right? It's really conditional execution and data flow. But think about it that way, because out of word execution is data flow within the sequential execution paradigm. Uh, a branch resolves when its dependencies are satisfied, right? And they may be satisfied 
depending on when the memory operation completes. And the memory operation can take 500 cycles or three cycles. So this is tough to deal, uh, fill the delay slot. That variable latency makes life even harder for the compiler. But we have discussed that last time. There's another issue with this, which is this. This is actually a, a, not a clean design. right? You're now tying the ISA semantics to the hardware implementation. This is true for a lot of the RISC architectures, or open microcode, for example. But delayed branching is one example that has persisted over years. You really tied the ISA semantics to the hardware implementation. So for example, Spark, MIPS, and HPPA. Uh, I guess, do people use Spark, ISA? I guess Oracle still has Spark, right? That's right, yes. So it's still alive. <laughs> uh, they have one delay slot after each branch. And they've had to support it. But if pipeline implementation changes with the next design, well, too bad. For to support backward compatibility in your code, you still need to support the delay slot, right? Because people have written code assuming that there's, the branch has delayed semantics. In fact, MIPS initially had the load delay slot, too. You can apply the same concept after a load. The next instruction that comes after the load always is independent of the load. Does that make sense? Well, you can think of why they had it. Right? Because remember the pipeline that we've discussed? There is a memory stage, and there is the uh, ALU stage, and there is the register file read stage. And if you have an instruction that's dependent on the load that comes right after the load, you need to stall the pipeline. If you want to get rid of that stall logic, well, change the semantics of the load instruction such that the next instruction is always independent and the compiler guarantees that independence. That way, you don't need to detect that dependence on the load. Remember, if you have data forwarding, that was, the, that was the only case in the pipeline where you still needed to stall. Make sense? So you can change the semantics of any instruction this way, if you will. It's really delayed execution. When you, don't, when you want to delay your decision, what do you do, for example? You do something else, right? And in the back of your mind, hopefully, you're waiting to make your decision. <laughs> That's what's happening here. OK, so uh, an aside, we'll, we'll talk about static instruction scheduling. But uh, how do you fill the delay slot? You can, you can be more fancy in filling the delay slot. And this, le this leads to different mechanisms. So reordering data independent operations, uh, instructions, uh, does not change program semantics. So you can take advantage of that. For example, this is an instruction. Uh, and this is branch. This uh, branch is independent of this instruction, and here's a delay slot. Uh, what you can do is, in this case, you can basically move the independent instructions to the delay slot if the branch and the instruction are within the same basic block. I remember basic block is a single entry, single exit piece of code. There are no branches in between the basic block. Uh, then now they become within the same basic block, sorry. Otherwise, it was outside the basic block, if you will, here. OK, uh, well, I guess it's still within the same basic block here because the branch, the branch is outside. OK, basically, uh, if the branch uh, doesn't depend on the instruction in the same block, that instruction can be moved. But let's take a look at more fancy cases. Uh, here we have a subtract instruction, dot, 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 and an add instruction over here. Uh, and the branch is dependent on this add instruction in this case. And you have a delay slot over here. And branch jumps to the target. What you can do is to move, uh, you can move the instruction from the target into the delay slot. Right? But that instruction should really be executed only when the branch is taken. Right? Now, if you have fancy delayed branching, this is great. This works. This is the if else case you were talking about, for example. This is the loop case you're talking about. If you don't have fancy delayed branching, you can still do this movement, actually. It's not that bad. But you need to ensure correctness if the branch is not taken. Right? So if the branch is taken, this is great because sub is going to be executed in the delay slot. If the branch is not taken, you've executed sub. So you'd better add something else to the not taken path that undoes the sub, which is an add, probably. right? This is called fix up code. So you can actually do this movement. But the compiler needs to be very careful in guaranteeing correctness by ensuring that the data flow or the semantics is not disturbed by inserting fix up code or undo code, if you will. You fill the delay slot, 
And if the branch, if this instruction shouldn't have been executed, then you undo the subtract, which is basically an add, right, on the other path. And if once, once you start doing code optimizations like this, you'll need to add more and more undo code or fix up code. <coughs> and your code becomes bigger and bigger. It's called code bloat. We will see that in static instruction scheduling. This, this makes sense, right? You could do the same thing from the fall through path. In this case, the branch is dependent on this add. And you have this uh, branch that is branching to uh, this subtract. Well, assuming that you've somehow, this is the fall through path. What you can do is you can move the subtract over here. But this subtract should not be executed if the branch is taken, which means that in the taken path, you add another add to fix up. Make sense? So this is good. You can maintain correctness. But it's a safe movement. What if this subtract, when it executes, generate an exception? And the program dies for some reason. So you optimize your program, and the programmer doesn't expect this, right? Does that make sense to you guys? So correctness is one issue, but safety is another issue when you move the code. What if this was not a subtract or uh, maybe floating point divide, for example, and if, if some, some value becomes 0, because you're really not supposed to execute this instruction, right? If the branch is uh, this way, you're really not supposed to execute this instruction. But the compiler is putting this instruction speculatively in the delay slot and it's executing it. And if the branch is really not supposed to be executed, it's undoing the operation. But this instruction may have a side effect. Side effect meaning unintended effect. It's not only doing subtract, but it, maybe it's generating an exception. right? So the compiler needs to be very careful. This is one of the reasons why you actually optimize the code when you turn on flags like minus 05 in GCC. How many of you have done that? Good. Some of you have done that. That's good. That's, you, it's very hard to debug, right? Because all of the code is reordered, and sometimes you may get an exception like this. So we'll see correctness and safety. So for correctness, this is fine, but safety, this may not be fine. And the compiler needs to guarantee both, although when you optimize the code, you're giving up some of those guarantees. <laughs> Sometimes, depending on what. <laughs> you, you can actually enable safe optimizations, right, in GCC. OK, this is clear, delayed branching. And we've covered a little bit of code optimization as well. Do something else. I'm going to rush through these slides. These are my, this is my favorite topic, but <laughs> uh, we've talked about this. Basically, do something else actually solves a lot of the problems. Do something else until the problem goes away. Right. <laughs> this is the idea of fine-grained multi-threading. Right. Basically, hardware has multiple thread contexts, and each cycle fetch engine fetches from a different thread context. This way, there's no need to predict the branch, no need to handle the control dependence. Because by the time the branch is resolved, you don't need another instruction from this thread. Well, that's, the same. that's what I said over here, right? And you can see it like this here. Uh, this, is the, this is your pipeline. While uh, you're fetching an instruction from one thread, uh, you're fetching the operands from another thread. Uh, and another thread is executing. Another thread may be executing in some other function unit. Another thread is storing its result. Not that, that. Basically, no two instructions exist in the pipeline from the same thread. Uh, in other words, branch, is, branch or instruction resolution latency is overlapped with the execution of other threads' instructions. This is the idea of overlapping latency, and we'll see this concept. This looks better. Of latency hiding or latency overlapping. You're really doing something else while this branch is uh, being resolved, right? During that latency. The upside is very nice, actually. There's no logic needed for handling control and data dependencies within a thread. Right? And assuming the threads are independent, you don't need any logic for this. There are several downsides which we have discussed. When a single thread performance suffers, right? You design this pipeline, but you're having only one instruction in the pipeline from a given thread. This is a trade-off, again, you're making. Do you get throughput from many threads, or do you improve the performance of a single thread? Now, if you're not going to detect dependencies within a thread, handle control dependencies, then 
you're giving up the single thread performance. Does that make sense? OK. This is kind of the trade-off with multi-core versus single-core processors, right? Do you design a much better single-core processor that can execute a single thread faster, or do you design a bunch of wimpy small processors that can execute many, many threads at the same time? Very similar trade-off. Well, we've talked about this. Extra logic for keeping thread context, and I'll get back to this. So, uh, one of you asked this when we talked about fine-grained multi-threading. And this doesn't work if you don't have any, a lot of threads in the pipeline. What if you have is only one thread? Well, you're fetching from that thread every n cycles, right? OK. So uh, let me refine the idea a little bit. Switch to another thread every cycle such that no two instructions from a thread are in the pipeline concurrently, basically. And I've talked about this. It tolerates the control and data dependency latencies by overlapping the latency with useful work from other threads. And also improves pipeline utilization by taking advantage of multiple threads. You can see it in both ways. So this is great if you have a program that has many, many threads, right? If you're, for example, uh, executing a web server application, and you're getting a lot of requests from different users, and you don't care about the latency of each user's request as much, you basically pipeline all of those requests in the same processor, and this is great. That's one example. Database transactions are another example. And this is a very old idea, too. This was actually first implemented uh, in Control Data 6600 processor, with the first out of order execution processor, actually, uh, which was a competitor to IBM. Uh, this was a very small group of engineers that competed with IBM and won. But then IBM came back <laughs> pretty strongly, <laughs> and they designed the IBM 36091, which introduced a lot of new uh, ideas. But this is earlier than that. I'll, I'll get to this. And also, uh, this is a three page paper that describes some of these ideas. But basically, a little bit of history. The CDC 6600's peripheral processing unit is fine-grained multi-threading. Peripheral processing unit is basically accessing memory. At, th at that time, it was called I.O. A processor executes a different I.O. thread every cycle. You can do multiple memory operations basically every cycle. Uh, and each, an operation from the same thread is executed every 10 cycles. It took 10 cycles to access memory or the I.O. unit. So they pipeline this access to the I.O. unit such that 10 threads could access it in a pipeline manner, but each thread saw can, could only access it every 10 cycles. It's the same idea. Uh, Burton Smith's HEP heterogeneous element processor basically took this idea and applied it to a system that was actually, uh, uh, that influenced a lot of other systems later on. It had 120 threads per processor. It's huge. And it had available queues versus unavailable queues. Basically, threads would move and it would be, they would be available or unavailable at any given time. But each thread can have only one instruction in the processor pipeline. And each thread was assumed to be independent. Basically, to each thread in fine-grained multi-threading, the processor looks like a non-pipeline machine, right? And we've talked about this. The, uh, this uh, trades off single thread performance for system throughput. And this is, what, uh, this is from the HEP heterogeneous element processor. Its cycle time was 100 nanoseconds and at eight stages. Which means that for a given, uh, it took 800 nanoseconds to complete an instruction, assuming no memory access. So if you think about memory access, it actually takes much longer. And you don't switch to the same thread until that memory access completes. That's why they had 120 threads to cover that long memory latency. Because if a th thread actually accessed memory, I think it was much longer than 800 nanoseconds. You needed about 100 threads to cover, un under 20 threads to cover the memory latency such that while a thread is waiting for memory, you could execute it. You could fill the, keep the pipeline full. OK, so, so this is, uh, I've kind of drawn this earlier uh, on the board, but this is what, the, what a multi-threaded pipeline looks like. This is with four thread contexts. So you need four program counters. And every cycle, you need to be able to select from them. And this is one very simplified view of the thread select logic. Right? Every cycle, you increment it then. It wraps around. <laughs> and you have four register files, and you select from uh, them every cycle. Make sense? So imagine the processor that has 120 threads. It has a huge register file, right? GPUs today are actually like this. They have huge register files because they can execute from many threads. When we cover GPUs, 
we'll see that the pipeline kind of looks similar to this. And this is a real processor that actually had fine grained multi threading, Sun Niagara. Uh, basically, it looks kind of similar, although the colors are different over here. <laughs> basically, you, if you look at this, you have four program counters and then a thread select mux. And you select which thread to fetch from uh, based on cache misses also. So if a thread is accessing memory, you don't select from that thread. You don't select that thread to be fetched. Basically, you insert a bubble into the pipeline. If, assuming there are no cache misses, basically you select from the other uh, uh, threads in a round robin manner. And there's also instructions to send in. And there must be register files. There you go. Register file times four. Basically, you copy all of these. Copy the context uh, of a thread. That's the thread context. which is the architectural state of a thread, right? PC plus register file. And everything else, special registers. And we'll call it SREGs, machine registers for, uh, for, for that thread, right? You need to copy that in a multi-threaded processor. Actually, many, thread, many processors today are multi-threaded, but they're not fine-grained multi-threaded. And I'll make that distinction perhaps later on. Uh, GPUs are fine-grained multi-threaded. Some other uh, processors like Niagara are fine-grained fine multi-threaded. Uh, the processors that probably you're using, Intel processors, for example, are simultaneous multi-threaded. So they don't switch to another thread every cycle. They want to keep the single thread performance. So they have all this complicated data dependence logic and out-of-order execution. But they're able to execute from multiple threads at the same cycle. And this improves system throughput without giving up single thread performance. But it comes, of course, at the cost of additional complexity. Now you have to execute a single thread fast as well as execute multiple threads at the same time. Okay, that's the, somebody brought up hyper-threading, but simultaneous multi-threading is the original name for it. And when we, if we, if we have the chance, we'll cover it. But we'll definitely, if you take 740, we definitely go into a lot of depth into how simultaneous multi-threading is implemented. We cannot cover everything in 447, unfortunately. Okay, advantages, well, no need for dependency checking, any kind of dependency checking between instructions. So I'll go through these quickly because we've talked about this. No need for branch prediction logic, obviously. And otherwise, bubble cycles are used for executing useful instructions from different threads. Right? If you actually predict branches, they may not be useful, right? Because you may be wrong in the prediction. Whereas here, all of the threads are hopefully useful. So maybe you're always doing useful work. So that's another advantage of this. You get better system throughput because you're executing more threads. You get better latency tolerance because you're late tolerating the latency of long latency operations, memory operations from one thread. Better utilization. These are all similar. Well, you're basically trading off complexity within a single thread complex, uh, to complexity with, of multiple threads, right? Now you need to have multiple hardware contexts and thread selection logic. This may not be that bad, actually. It's just a bunch of muxes as we've seen, right? You don't need forwarding logic, for example. Forwarding logic is a little bit more complex. Well, this is a big disadvantage, actually. Reduce single thread performance. If you really care about single thread performance, then this is not a good design, right? And if you have many threads, somebody brought it up last time, uh, you get contention between threads and caches and memory, right? If your cache space is limited, actually, you brought it up, right? last time. If your cache space is limited, let's say one megabyte, if you have only one thread using that one megabyte, maybe it fits in the cache, right? Maybe it has the data working set that's one megabyte. But if you have 120 threads, now all of those 120 threads are contending for that one megabyte cache. <coughs> well, maybe they, don't, they each need one megabyte cache. Well, too bad. Now you're actually generating a lot of, a lot of new memory requests that were not present in the single thread machine. So your performance can actually be worse, even though you're utilizing your pipeline better. And this contention is very important in multi-threaded engines. Does that make sense? We'll, we'll get back to this in multi-core processors. Well, yeah, if the threads are not completely independent, you need to detect dependencies between threads, right? For example, if the threads are communicating through shared memory, if one thread can reference a memory location another thread can write to, you'd better detect that dependence, right? Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to maintain correctness. 
And we'll talk about that when we, uh, well, we won't talk about exactly how this is done, but we'll, we'll see mechanisms for load store dependency checking for single thread processors later on. Okay. Is this clear? Any other advantages or disadvantages? I think this may be a thorough slide. Is it too hot still here? What am I feeling? Oh, some of you are good. That's good. Maybe I'm just excited about fine grained multi threading and I'm sweating. <laughs> okay. Now let's uh, dive into branch prediction. A branch prediction, basically, guessing the next fetch address is another solution. And let me do this so that. Basically, the idea is simple. You guess the next instruction to fetch. Let me give you the benefit of this. Uh, this is what happens if you actually, this is, this is the code we're going to execute. You have this load, and this is the pipeline. It's a four stage pipeline, I guess five stage pipeline. Uh, when you get to the branch, when you fetch the branch, you do not know what instruction to fetch. It could be this one, it could be this one, right? So if you stall, this is what happens. Branch resolves over here. Let's say you fetch the next instruction. This is a very bad example, of course. The branch resolves after the right back stage. But this is just to illustrate the point. Right? You fetch the next instruction only after the branch resolves. As a result, you take, I think, 12 cycles over here. If, with branch prediction, what happens is when you fetch the branch, you predict the next instruction. And assuming that the prediction is branch is, I guess, not taken. Right? This is a not taken path. You fetch this add, and you fill the pipeline with the, fetch, uh, with the predicted path. And if the branch is correct, that's great. right? If the branch is predicted correctly, you're done after eight cycles. So you can improve performance significantly instead of having bu bubbles. But we've talked about this. If the branch is incorrect, then you have a problem. If the branch is predicted incorrectly, then you have a problem. right? This is, I'm going through this relatively fast, but uh, which one is the branch? The branch is the blue one. right? Basically, you fetch the branch, blue one, it resolves, and you figured out that actually you fetched the wrong thing afterwards. Then you need to flush the pipeline and refetch from the next instruction. And if you do the math, I think this takes 12 cycles in this pipeline. So you don't gain the, anything. Okay. Basically, how do we keep the pipeline full in the presence of branches? You guess the next instruction when the branch is fetched, and this requires guessing the direction and the target of the branch. And this is kind of a modern pipeline. In this example, I, I'm going to use this because I'm going to talk about uh, predication later on. So we'll keep this in mind uh, for 50 minutes or until Wednesday. But basically, this is a modern pipeline, which you will be read about in the microarchitecture of superscalar processors. And modern pipelines are very deep. If you fetch A, at that point, you make a decision. Predict that this is the next uh, uh, instruction that will come. And then you fetch from this path. And at the end, when the branch actually executes, maybe 20 stages later, you can count this one, you verify the prediction. Is my prediction correct? Right. Actually, in Pent Pentium 4, it was 20 stages, exactly. The branch is resolved 20 cycles after it's fetched. That's a long time, right? Because you need to do all of these things. And it's very heavily pipelined so that you it could support a clock frequency of over 3 gigahertz. You verify the prediction. If the prediction is correct, everything is great. You filled it at 20 stage pipeline. If the prediction is incorrect, too bad. You flush all of that work. And then you fetch from the correct target. OK? Well, that's how it works. Uh, the, the simplest prediction mechanism, as we've discussed, is always predict PC plus 4. Right? And let's, let's take a look at the effectiveness of this. Let's do some performance analysis. If this instruction is a branch, Assume that the branch is, let's be a little bit more aggressive, assume that it's resolved in the ALU stage. So when the branch is over here, you've already fetched two instructions after that. But after the ALU stage, you can redirect the fetch. Assuming that the branch is taken, you can change the instruction fetch stage to the target, such that you can fetch the target instruction. You need to get rid of these instructions. Right. That's the pipeline flush in another, viewed another way. Does that make sense? Basically, this, this happens if, the, uh, if you predict the next instruction is PC plus 4. Basically, predict the branch is not taken. But the branch is actually taken, which is determined at the end of the ALU stage. Which means that you've actually lost two cycles. right? So when a branch resolves, uh, branch target is fetched. 
and all instructions fetched since instruction H uh, are discarded, must be flushed, assuming the branch was predicted incorrectly. If, if it's cor predicted correctly, then there's no problem, right? These are called the wrong path instructions, by the way, or mispredicted path instructions. You fetch them, but you need to get rid of them. Well, killing is one way of <laughs> getting rid of them, I guess. Actually, there are many methods people have used to get rid of them. You can go and invalidate all of the pipeline registers, right, when the branch is flushed. Or you can turn everything into no ops. OK. So let's take a look, a look at the performance analysis. Uh, correct guess, there's no penalty, right? You basically keep the pipeline moving. Your instructions per cycle is still one. And remember, if you remember the calculations that I put up, 86% of the time we had a correct guess with program, uh, if you predict always not taken, right? Because 86% of the time, the next program counter is the next sequential program counter, PC plus four. And I'll give you the number. If you have an incorrect guess, now you have two bubbles, right? You fetch two things that you need to discard. Assume that there's no data dependencies. I should fix the slide. Let me fix it right now such that I don't forget. Here, I feel much better now. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, this is how I get the 86%. Uh, remember, one in five instruction was a branch, 20% control flow of instructions, and 70% of the control flow of instructions are taken, which means that if you're predicting PC equals, next PC equals PC plus four, 70, uh, 80 percent of the time, your next sequential is correct. And in the remaining 20 percent of the time, uh, 30 percent of those 20 percent of control flow instructions, you're correct, right? Because 30 percent of the time, next instruction is really the not taken path. So 80, 86 percent comes from 80 plus uh, 20 times 0.2. Three, right? Yes. OK, that's better. <laughs> OK, you, you can do the calculation. But what is the cycles per instruction? Cycles per instruction is uh, you basically have one instruction per cycle if everything is correct. Only when you're incorrect, you get two additional cycles. Right? These are just overhead cycles. So if you do the calculation, if everything is correct, you get one. But 20% of the time, uh, well, not 20% of the time. It's actually 14% of the time you get two additional cycles. Why is it 14%? Because 20% of all instructions uh, are control flow, and 70% of them are taken, which is when you're incorrect. So your CPI increases to 1.28. So that's a huge performance loss, right? Even with this simple pipeline, 28%. And I'll give you some examples later on why, uh, how the performance loss changes as you increase the depth of the pipeline. And this also assumes a two cycle penalty on a branch. You lose only two instructions. In Pentium 4, you lose, well, that's a lot of instructions, let me think. It's, it's 20 cycles, but you, you can actually fetch uh, three instructions per cycle. So you lose at least 60 instructions, and sometimes even more. So you can think of that multiplier, right? <laughs> that becomes terrible. So this is the probability of a wrong guess, and this is the penalty for a wrong guess. So you can actually make performance better by reducing the probability of a wrong guess. This is better branch prediction, better guessing, if you will, or better magic. <laughs> or you could reduce the penalty for a wrong guess. Instead of having two, you could make this one. Now this becomes harder as you, deeper, uh, as you pipeline your machine deeper and deeper. But you could do that. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at this part first. Well, this is a mess over here. But I told you that branch gets resolved in the ALU stage, right? Basically, at the, at the end of the ALU stage, you compare the two registers and check if the registers are equal. Let's say you have branch equal, right? It checks whether register one is equal to register two or source, two source registers are equal. If so, you take the target. That's where your branch is resolved. You could try to reduce the branch misprediction penalty, penalty for a wrong guess by moving that logic, branch resolution logic here, as I've done here. Basically, get the source registers for the branch, and then add a comparison, branch condition computation logic, right in the stage, and then based on that, determine whether or not you change the PC. And target address is determined over here, because we are assuming that actually uh, your target address is actually PC, PC plus offset for many branches. 
Or even if it's, it's from a register, then read another register right, at another port. This reduces the branch misprediction penalty to one cycle, right? Because you're resolving the branch in the decode and register read stage for this pipeline. And your CPI, as a result, cycles per instruction, as a result, becomes 1.14, because you reduce this uh, penalty for a wrong guess to one cycle instead of two cycles. So you need to add these, basically. This is the target computation logic, and this is the branch condition computation logic. Is that a good idea? Yes? Well, it depends on what your critical path is. Mm -hmm. This will extend it if it happens to be your critical path, and if it doesn't, then it's a great idea. That's right, yes. That's actually, it depends on the right answer. But now you've qualified it very, very well. <laughs> it's exactly true. If this extends your critical path, this may be a bad idea because, again, remember, cycles per instruction just looks at one part of the performance equation. Right? It doesn't consider clock cycle time. If this extends your clock cycle time significantly, you may be reducing your cycles per instruction, which is great, but you may be extending your clock cycle time significantly. But if this is not your critical path, maybe you're not affecting it. And maybe it's OK to increase the clock cycle time a little bit to reduce the CPI significantly. So that's, again, the answer is it depends. You need to do the performance analysis. But it's likely that it's, this will extend your critical path in this pipeline from experience. <laughs> Usually, memory is the critical path. But if you optimize memory this way, now you're reading the register file and also doing the comparison. Basically, you're adding register and ALU and a bunch of muxing over here. OK? So whenever you're doing performance analysis, you may see a lot of CPI results, but always keep the full performance equation in mind. CPI is just part of the equation. You may be reducing CPI significantly, but you may be extending the clock cycle time. OK, let's take a look at this part now. Sorry, I'll have to go back. But remember, there are two parts of the equation. You would like to either minimize the penalty for a wrong guess, and you'll do your best. This is critical path design, right? You should do your best to minimize this, uh, assuming performance is important for you, of course. And if the performance, again, important for you, probability of a wrong guess should be minimized too. And how do you do that? So we're going to concern ourselves a lot with this. How do you do enhanced branch prediction? Remember, we would like to predict the next fetch address to be used in the next cycle. This requires three things to be predicted at the fetch stage. Whether the fetched instruction is a branch, the direction of that branch, assuming it's conditional, and the target address of the branch, if it's going to be predicted taken. Right. These three things need to be provided. And the hardest part is actually when you need all of them at the same time. So let's, let's, say, let's handle this case first. How do you actually figure out that uh, you have a branch target address? Or how do you figure out whether the fetched instruction is a branch? We'll add an auxiliary structure to the pipeline to do that. And the observation is that for many branches, target address remains the same across dynamic instances. You execute the branch once. The target address, assuming it's computed as PC plus offset, the PC doesn't change for that branch, and offset doesn't change. So once you've computed it, you can record it in a structure in the fetch stage and say, OK, this is my target address. Right. Does that make sense? You don't need to compute it over and over and over and over, because the PC doesn't change, offset doesn't change for the same branch instruction. Yes? What difference does that make, though? Because combinational logic, you're not going to remove it from the circuit, so it's still going to be running its combinational logic. That's right. Uh, the goal is to get it early. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's, uh, I guess you could still generate it in the fetch stage also. That's right. Oh, I see. I yeah. See okay. Yeah. The goal, because, because you don't have the instruction yet, right? Remember the fetch stage, you're fetching the instruction, and you would like to get the target address while you're fetching the instruction. This is your current program counter. This is your instruction memory, or iCache, let's say. And you get the instruction at the end. But before you get the instruction, you want to get its target address such that you can feed that target address to the program counter. Right. And if you get the instruction and do the address computation after that, it may lengthen your critical path, because you're doing a memory access and the address computation. And also, it requires that you know the offset fields and everything that's needed for the target computation. right? But if you add this auxiliary structure, 
which I'll call the branch target buffer. And with the program counter, you index it. And it tells you that at this program counter, I've had a branch in the past when I executed it. Its type is this. It's a conditional branch. It's an unconditional branch. And its target address is this. Before you fetch the instruction, now you've got the target. Now you can feed it from here. And before you fetch the instruction, you actually know its type because you've executed in the past. You're just remembering it. So you can kill two birds with one stone. Right? And the stone is called the branch target buffer. Make sense? It's beautiful, right? <laughs> so that's the idea. Store the target address from, a pre from the previous instance and access it with the program counter in parallel with the instruction cache, instruction memory access. And also, you can store many, many things here, as I said, whether the instruction is a conditional branch, whether the instruction is an unconditional branch, a call, a return, and we'll see those later on. Let's concern ourselves with the conditional branch. If you store a conditional branch right now, now you can generate the controls for this PC uh, max, right? Because before you fetch the instruction, or why, why, at, the, at the same time you fetch the instruction, you already know what that instruction is. Make sense? This actually doesn't need to be separate also, right? This could be part of the iCache as well. For each instruction, you have the separate information that has target as well as the type. Now, usually, it's a separate structure because this tends to be smaller and you want to get it quicker than this because there is more computation that happens to it because it goes through this mux. OK. Yeah, it's called the branch target buffer, uh, branch target address cache. This is IBM terminology. Yes? Is the instruction memory usually uh, read only? And I could imagine some issues coming up if a program tries to modify itself and then get. So that's an excellent question. Yeah, there, not, not necessarily. Some ISAs uh, allow self modifying code, right? x86, for example. Then, of course, this, needs, this may need to change, right? But this is, again, used for prediction purposes only. So if you're incorrect, you're going to correct it. You're going to still execute the branch. OK? So for everything I'll say over here, this is for prediction purposes. You could use something to accelerate the execution of the branch, but let's not discuss that right now. OK? So if you're, this is the beauty of design, computer architecture. right? You can be creative and make things run much faster. You can do things that are very different. OK, so let me give you actually the fetch stage. I've given you this part. This is the cache of target addresses, BTB, branch target buffer. And I'm going to assume a direction predictor for now. We're going to look at the direction predictor. This is for conditional branch prediction again. For conditional branch, you need to know whether the instruction is a branch and its target address. It's going to come from here. And also the predicted direction, whether you should take the target address here from here or whether you should take PC plus 4. So that's what the direction predictor will tell us. So you use the program counter, the address of the current branch, to index or access this cache of target addresses, which basically, uh, at the same time, you use this program counter to index into this direction predictor that says taken or not taken, prediction again. And cache of target addresses, it may be a hit, which means that you already executed this branch and it's still here in this cache. Hit means that. Oh, hit actually implies that it's a branch, right? Because you, you'd better not store a target address here for a PC that's not a branch. That makes no sense, right? <laughs> OK, hit implies that this is a branch, and you get the target address. And you use the direction prediction to choose, basically the direction prediction says taken. And you or the taken with the hit signal. That also makes sense, right? Oh, well, sorry, yeah, that's, a, that's an end, you're right. <laughs> if you do an OR, then you'll get the wrong result. <laughs> then you'll have an uh, incorrect pipeline. <laughs> yes, you end it. Uh, this means that if the branch, uh, the, the, next, the next program counter is a target address only if you get a hit in this target buffer and the branch is predicted taken. For every other case, the next instruction should be PC plus instruction size. 
right? Yes. Why is the direction predictor not part of the cache of target addresses? Yes, that's an excellent question. It could be, actually. I just want to separate it because you were going to use different things over here. It doesn't have to be. But it could be. If it's a simple direction predictor, you can have one bit, for, for example, saying, oh, most of the time I've seen this branch, it was taken. So you could actually have it over here. You could combine all of these structures. You could actually combine all of these into the iCache with the instruction it's themselves. That's an excellent point. But we're going to see sophisticated branch predictors that use information other than the pro program counter. So this target address and whether or, is, whether or not an instruction is a branch is really a function of the program counter. But the direction prediction, you may want to use other information. Make sense? And we'll see some examples of that. Actually, you may want to use completely other information and not the program counter at all. <laughs> That's where the black magic comes in. <laughs> but if you, read the, if you read the paper, then you'll see that it's not black magic. OK, so assume that uh, uh, now if you actually all predict always taken, now you can do always taken prediction, right? Because you have this cache of target addresses. And this direction predictor may be nothing over here. You, all, you say always taken. Right? That's not the best prediction. But assuming that you can do that, now your CPI goes down to 1.12. Why? Because 70% of the branches are taken. And for the branches, you're only inaccurate 30% of the time. So for only 6% of the instructions, you incur this two cycle penalty. So your CPI is 1.12, which is much better than 1.28. So even with always taken, we've done much better. And we're going to try to reduce it to as close to 1 as possible. Even though these numbers sound small, again, remember, this 2 is really not 2 in modern machines. It's more like 60 or longer. So more sophisticated, <laughs> uh, basically, this is what I meant. Uh, you may want to have a direction predictor that also takes into account which direction earlier branches went. Not this branch, but the branches that I fetched earlier. Where did they go? Maybe they, they tell us some information about where this branch will go. Now you can consider thinking why that would be the case. If you read the McFarling paper, you shouldn't be thinking by now. But if you haven't, thinking is good. <laughs> thinking is hard, but good. <laughs> so that's, that's exactly why this answers your question. But we'll see why this makes sense. Okay. So let me cover this quickly, and then we'll take a short break. Basically, we'll look at a bunch of simple direction prediction schemes. Some of them will be compile time or program time, static, meaning the direction prediction doesn't change during the runtime of the program after it's compiled. Always not taken, always taken, backward taken, forward not taken, profile based, and we'll see a bunch of other ones. And then we'll also look at the runtime mechanisms, where the hardware actually does the prediction. Last time prediction is a very simple one, for example, where you could keep the information in the BTB, right target buffer. And then we'll make this more sophisticated, add more compile time mechanisms, and add more runtime mechanisms. And actually, uh, today, uh, many processors use both compile time mechanisms, but they also have very sophisticated branch predictors, especially if they, if they care about single thread performance. Right? If you're designing a fine-grained multi-thread machine, don't bother doing this. <laughs> Because you, don't, you won't have another branch in the pipeline. You won't have another instruction in the pipeline after you fetch a branch from the same thread. OK, I guess let's take a break over here uh, for five minutes. And let's come back and hopefully finish the remaining 67 slides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably not. Simple ones first. And these are the ones I classify as simple. But basically, always not taken, we've seen, right? It's simple to implement, the advantage. No need for BTB, no direction prediction, right? The downside is it's low accuracy, 30 to 40% accuracy empirically. But we already discussed that compile can lay out code such that the likely path is the not taken path. If it can do that, it's great. And I've recommended you a paper. That's not required, by the way, it's optional. But I know you have a lot of time to read papers, so you can <laughs> read it and tell me what you think. <laughs> It's a fun paper to read. Uh, always taken is a little bit more accurate. Again, it requires no direction prediction. That's nice. It has better accuracy uh, because backward branches are usually taken, as we've discussed earlier, right? Loop branches. 
And backward branch, what's a backward branch? Basically, we've discussed that also. A target address is lower than the branch PC. Okay. People have come up with other mechanisms. What they've found out is backward branches are usually taken, but forward branches are usually not taken. To take advantage of that, they predict backward branches as taken, others that not, not taken. Right? Again, this is static branch prediction. Because you know whether a branch is backward or forward once you lay out the code. Right? Again, the compiler can take advantage of this by laying out the code such that the likely taken path is the not, well, such that you do this prediction better. Right? Such that the, uh, let's see, let me put it this way. Such that the taken branches are made backward and not taken branches are made forward. Right? Compiler can do that. Let's look at more sophisticated mechanisms. Remember we talked about profiling? The compiler runs the program once or multiple times with their presentive input sets and figures out something about the branches or about something else. Here we're going to figure out something about branches. So we're going to do profile-based branch prediction. And the idea is compiler determines the likely direction for each branch using one or more profiler, profiling runs. And encodes that direction as a hint bit in the branch instruction format. So in the branch instruction format, you have a one bit saying, Compiler says this branch is going to be very likely taken or not taken. Or compiler has no idea what this branch will do. Maybe you have two bits. Two bits may be better, right? <laughs> does that make sense? And how does the compiler set that bit? Well, profiling, right? Compiler runs the code with a bunch of input sets and says, oh, 95% of the time this branch was executed was taken. So I'm going to set that bit to not taken, such that when the hardware fetches that, it basically uses that bit to predict the next fetch address. Again, you still need a BTB because you need to know whether the compiler actually marked that as taken or not taken. Well, you could actually do it from here too. That's why BTB and this can be combined in this case. But you still need to cache the target address if it's predicted taken, right? Okay. The upside of this, the big upside of this compared to these three mechanisms is now you can do per branch prediction, right? Because every branch can have a bit associated with it saying, <coughs> compiler says this is taken or not taken, or this is likely taken or, not, or likely not taken. <coughs> That's why it's more accurate than the schemes in the previous slide. Yes? Is this something you have to add to the ISA? Mm -hmm. or that's how it makes it into the instruction cache? Absolutely, yes. You need to have this bit in the ISA in the branch that has that information. And many ISAs actually have that. x86 has that, for example. Which ARM, I don't know. My, my bet is that they would have it, but no. Okay. Really? You haven't seen it at all? There's no. They want the 32 megabytes. OK. <laughs> well, maybe they don't. <laughs> it may be a good idea because sometimes the compiler can know. This is accurate if the profile is representative, of course. We talked about this, right? If the profile is totally different from what the, uh, what the program will run on later on in real execution time. For example, if you're searching for Super Bowl, when Super Bowl is not happening, maybe you won't get <laughs> a good branch prediction accuracy on a program that's optimized for Super Bowl, right? Does that make sense? Your profile needs to be represented. Well, this is the downside because it requires hint bits. And these are bits that are not necessary for execution, but they aid performance optimizations like branch prediction, right? Does that make sense? For example, or uh, this is an example. You, the compiler, the, you, in the ISA, you can add hint bits saying this load will likely miss in the cache. Right? Again, the compiler can profile the program and set those bits. Uh, the other downside compared to later mechanisms we'll see is accuracy depends on dynamic branch behavior. What does this mean? Basically, you have only one bit per, per branch, right? But the branch can be executed many, many times. The compiler can encode only one thing. This is likely taken or likely not taken. What if the branch looks like this? Basically, during its execution, this is time. And during its execution, branch is taken for 10 times and not taken for the next 10 times. You can only encode taken or not taken. This, and you get only 50% accuracy this way. Right? Because the compiler doesn't have the freedom to encode the entire execution. And even if it encodes the entire execution, maybe it's going to be wrong. right? Does that make sense? Or the branch can look like this, taken, not taken, taken, not taken, taken, not taken, taken, not taken. Again, you get 50% accuracy. <coughs> OK? But we'll see that these are actually very nicely predictable branches with dynamic branch prediction. 
We could actually, we can imagine memorizing this pattern, right? <coughs> and predicting it perfectly correctly. Okay. And of course, we've talked about this. Accuracy depends on the representativeness of the profile input set. Here, I guess it doesn't matter, right? You could pick one of them. The compiler could pick one of them, and it always gets 50% accuracy. But what if the branch is always taken, and the compiler encoded is that it's likely not taken? Well, you're too, too bad. Now you get 0% accuracy. And there's no way to correct it, unless you do hardware-based branch prediction. The second stat static branch prediction is, again, program-based or program analysis-based. You still need hint bits, very similar to this. But the idea over here is, instead of profiling, Profile. So what is the downside of profiling? It adds time to the comp compilation, right? Actually, for this reason, many software is not profiled, even though it's a good idea to improve performance. If you have a huge piece of code, very complex, for example, like Windows, <laughs> you can profile it to optimize it, but that profiling, the compilation of Windows already takes hours and hours and hours, days in some cases. If you do profiling, then you're extending that time to weeks, maybe. <laughs> so that's the downside of profiling. The uh, other approach is to use program analysis. Basically use heuristics based on program analysis to determine statically predicted direction. And again, the compiler can do this. Uh, and this paper is actually another nice paper that I would recommend. It's called Branch Prediction for Free. <laughs> it's in Programming Language Design and Implementation 1993. Uh, and they've shown that with these heuristics only, no profiling information, you get only 20% misprediction rate, which is respectable. But we'll see with dynamic branch prediction, you get around 95%, uh, well, 5% misprediction rate, which is still pretty good, but we want more, <laughs> or we want less, smaller misprediction rate. So what are these heuristics? For example, this paper discusses predict branch less than or equal to zero as not taken. Why? They found out that negative integer is used as error values in many programs, and you use branch less than or equal to zero to indicate error in many programs. Heuristic, not always correct. But you don't always need to be correct because you're doing prediction here. You're always verifying the prediction. Another heuristic, loop heuristic, for example. If you have a branch guarding a loop execution, predict it as taken or execute the loop. Because many programs actually execute the loop. So this is a branch that looks like this. If Blah, blah. Then you have a four. Blah, blah. <laughs> the heuristic is that predict that you're going to go to the four. Because programs are usually loop based. Again, this is a heuristic. If a branch is comparing two floating point values, predict them as being not equal. Predict that as not taken. <laughs> or two pointer values. It's very unlikely that two pointer values will be equal. Or if a branch is comparing a pointer to a null, again, predict that as not taken. So again, it's unlikely. In the common case, it's not going to be that way. So these are heuristics. They have a bunch of heuristics this way. The upside is this doesn't require profiling. Once you set the heuristics, the, it's relatively easy to determine. And these are relatively easy heuristics. The downside, obviously, is this, right? The heuristics may not be representative or good. Now you have the heuristic representativeness problem instead of profile representativeness pro problem. And it requires some compiler analysis to, for these heuristics and ISA support. But this is true for other static methods also. You need to have this ISA support to convey from the software to the hardware whether the branch is likely taken or likely not taken. Okay. Well, there's another approach. These were compiler approaches, uh, profile-based and program-based. I'm switching between these two so that you can see the difference. This is programmer-based. Now that you, as the programmer, tell the hardware what to do. Well, that's, that's basically it, right? <laughs> How do you do that? Well, at the programming language, you have these pragmas or hints. And C has that, for example. You may have used that. These hints qualify a branch as likely taken versus likely not taken. And when you're programming, you, says, you say likely taken or likely not taken. And that gets compiled, and that gets communicated into the ISA. The upside is it doesn't require profiling or program analysis. And as a programmer, sometimes you may have a lot of information, right? Because you may know the input set, maybe. You may think, uh, you may know of what the input set will look like. 
The downside is now you have support across the entire stack, right? Programming language needs to support it. Well, the other downside, yes, Burden's a programmer. I was afraid for some uh, second that I wouldn't have this on the slide, but this is very important. <laughs> now, if this is the only mechanism, then you have a problem because programmers already have difficulty programming correct code, right? Now you're asking them actually to <laughs> optimize their code. So this does burden the programmer. It may be useful for those programmers who can actually do this, but it may not, it, it's not, if this is the only mechanism you're using to predict your branches, then good luck. Not a good idea. But it's good to have the support for those programmers who can do it. So let's take a look at these pragmas a little bit. These are actually keywords that enable a programmer to convey hints to lower levels of the pro transformation hierarchy. Remember the transformation hierarchy? We had the programs. Well, we had the problems, and then algorithms, and then programs, and then runtime system, and then ISA, dot, dot, dot. At the program level, you convey information down to the compiler, for example. And that conveys that information to the hardware. It's beautiful. You can have many. And this is from C. If likely x, do this. By having that likely over there, you're telling the programming language and the compiler, in turn, that this is likely going to be taken. Right? Yes? Well, this is programming language level. But I mean, the hint has to be passed. Hints has to be passed. Yeah, the compiler needs to take this yeah. seriously and say, the programmer tells me this, so I'm going to pass it to the hardware. The, all the all x86 x86 needs to support is the hint bit. Yes. Right. Does that do you know? Yeah, x86 has hint bits. You could do that. You could do this in C right now, if you wish. You can try it out and let me know if it works. <laughs> let me know if the hardware takes into account what you say. That may not be true also, again. Well, we'll talk about it when we get to prefetching, for example. You can insert prefetch instructions that the hardware later drops, because it doesn't have enough bandwidth to have them, right? So this is, these are, this is a soft contract between the programmer and, the, uh, and all the way down, right? Hard contract is, I want to do an add, and that add is done. Soft contract is, I'm going to give you a hint, but I know that you may not be able to honor it. Kind of not so nice, right? You could make it a hard contract, but then it burdens the hardware designer. OK, unlikely is over here, right? If unlikely error, then do this. And there are many other hints and optimizations that can be enabled with such pragma. So this is the pragma. Likely is a pragma here. For example, whether a loop can be parallelized, the programmer can tell the compiler, try to parallelize this loop, because I think there are not many dependencies. And we'll take a look at that when we talk about vector processing. What is a parallelizable loop? Parallelizable me loop means that different iterations of the loop are independent of each other, which means that you can execute them in parallel if you have multiprocessors. Now, the compiler may not be able to figure that out, especially if there are memory references. But the programmer may know. And the programmer can tell the compiler, try to parallelize this loop. And this is a pragma from OpenMP, one of the parallel languages. Pragma OpenMP Parallel. Basically, the OpenMP Parallel directive explicitly instructs the compiler to parallelize the chosen segment of code. And this is from the OpenMP manual, I think. Make sense? So these pragmas can be powerful. And going forward, it could be useful. But if this is the only way you're doing things, then you're really burdening the programmer. Keep that in mind. OK, all these previous techniques can be combined, actually, profile-based, program-based, programmer-based. I'll let you think about how would you do that. Which one overrides which other one? Right? Again, this is a level of trust. The compiler can say, programmer, I don't care about you. I'll do my profiling and do whatever I wish to. That may not be a good thing. Right? But then sometimes the programmer may not know also. Right? That's too bad. So, but there is a common disadvantage to all of the three techniques. What is that? I've given you that one, actually. When I show the taken, 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 not taken, not taken, not taken. Yes? Well, that it's static. Exactly, yes. It's static. Well, it's here. <laughs> it's not adaptive by definition, right? It's not dynamic. It's not observing what's happening at runtime, and it's not adapting to it. And that's a big disadvantage to all of these techniques. You cannot adapt to dynamic changes in branch behavior. And branch behavior may change depending on the input set, the phase of the program what path actually you're taking in the program. We're going to see that. This can be mitigated a little bit if you do dynamic compilation. 
What is dynamic compilation? Remember the transmitter or the Java virtual machine? These basically instrument the code such that they figure out what are the hot paths, hot values. And once in a while, they dynamically recompile the program. And maybe they change the hint bits based on that dynamic recompilation, right? It's heavy because you need to profile the program at runtime. And because it's heavy, it's not, it cannot be done at a fine granularity. You cannot recompile the program for every branch, every time you execute a branch, right? That's expensive because there's a lot of overhead. So you can make these dynamic by using them in a dynamic compiler. But it's difficult to adapt at a very fine granularity. Fine granularity means smaller number of cycles. You change your decision for a branch maybe every 10 cycles. Maybe every time you fetch the branch, you make a different decision. It's very difficult to do that with these techniques. Well, it's impossible to do this without a dynamic compiler with these techniques. But it's very difficult to do this at a fine grain with a dynamic compiler. So the idea of dynamic branch prediction is predicting the branches based on dynamic information that is collected at runtime by the hardware. Advantage, now you can do prediction based on the history of the execution of the branches. Right. Remember, if you see taken, 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 taken 10 times and then not taken af after that, you can adapt. You can switch to not taken after some point. We'll see how we can do that. There's no need for static profiling. Input set representativeness problem goes away. Compiler doesn't need to be involved. I guess that's, that could be nice or not nice. Disadvantages, now more complex, because it requires additional hardware. And we'll see what that hardware is. So let's take a look at some of these predictors. Oh, we still have a lot of time. Maybe we'll cover the 100 slides. <laughs> it's getting hot here, right? I guess we'll, we'll, we need to, no? You guys are OK with it? OK, well, we're going to fix this in, in the next lecture. Uh, would you like me to open a window? No, that's all right. <laughs> Otherwise, some other people who, who don't think it's hot may get even colder. So last time predictor is a very, very simple uh, dynamic prediction mechanism. Basically, you have a single bit per branch. It could be stored in the BTB, as you suggested, or it could be stored in the iCache. Again, if you combine BTB and the iCache. Or it could be a separate predictor, separate direction predictor. Basically, this bit indicates which direction the branch went last time it was executed. That's it. You execute the branch, you record taken or not taken, and the next time you fetch this branch, you use that as your prediction. Beautiful, right? Simple. If you do even the simple thing, you get 90% accuracy here, right? Assuming you start with a taken prediction. You can do the calculation yourself, right? You mispredict uh, this one and this one, right? Which one? Yeah, the first one, right? Right? 90% is pretty high. Remember, we, with the static prediction, you actually predict. Uh, yeah, 50%. Yes, 50% of this. Uh, the downside of this is it always, it's good here, but you can do better. Basically, this always mispredicts the last iteration and the first iteration of a loop branch. Now, what do I mean by that? This is not a loop branch at the top that I showed you over here. But if you do this, let's say you have the beginning of a loop. Well, I guess I should call it a loop. And then branch loop. And assume that this keeps executing. And then, uh, so this is the taken path, and this is the not taken path. And then eventually, you have another branch that takes you here, right? So you keep executing this loop several times. And once you enter the loop, you keep executing many iterations, let's say. <coughs> so the last iteration, let's assume that you start with always a, a, a taken prediction. While the loop is iterating, you get it correct all the time, right? Taken, 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 taken. But the last iteration, you get it incorrect, because you predict it as taken. Whereas the branch is taking you out of the loop. So that's one place where you get incorrect. And the last time you've executed it was not taken. Right? Now later on, you go back to this loop and you execute it again. You've encountered this branch. You predict it as not taken because the last time it was really not taken. Right? Because you got out of the loop. But now assuming that you iterate a lot in the loop, you mispredict it. Because you should really predict it taken. Right? So this mispredicts the last iteration of the branch. 
uh, well, the last iteration of a loop branch and the first iteration also when you enter it. Does that make sense? In the steady state. Assuming the program operates based on loops. So basically, your accuracy for your loop with n iteration is n minus 2 over n. Now, this may not be a problem if n is 1 billion, right? <laughs> you get only 2 out of 1 billion incorrect. But if your n is small, if your loop is iterating maybe 3 times, your accuracy becomes 33%. If your loop is iterating, I know 1 times, I guess that doesn't hold for 1 time. <laughs> you get always incorrect. So this is, don't take this as a general formula with, for all n. Uh, but yeah, this works for loop branches with loops with large number of iterations. But here, your n is 1 here. You enter the loop, execute it once, and then get out of it. Right. Basically, the branch is taken, and then not taken, taken, not taken, taken, not taken, taken, not taken. You get 0% accuracy on this one. Because the, predict, uh, the direction of the branch this time is different from the last time. And that's true for this kind of branches. And these branches exist, actually. That sounds terrible, right? Well, how do you fix this problem? Yes? Don't some architectures have like a specific register for a loop counter? So that's right. You're getting ahead of us. <laughs> we're, we're not going to talk about that. But yes, some architectures actually have a very specialized branch predictor, which we will not discuss. And the idea is to detect these loops and to predict them. And the idea is actually try to predict how many times you're going to iterate over the loop. We're going to look at something different. But that's a very specialized branch prediction mechanism. I told you that branch prediction is going to go crazy. But Intel, for example, and AMD architectures have this loop detectors. They call it the loop detectors. They detect how many times a loop branch is going to iterate and do the prediction. We're not going to do that. We're going to fix, a, fix it with a sim more simple way. What could it be? Well, one observation is that maybe we changed our decision too quickly. Right? Maybe not for this one, but later. Well, uh, actually, let's do this first. Uh, let's assume that you have 85% accuracy, which is not actually too bad for the last time predictor. Your CPI is now 1.06. Right? So you're doing pretty good with just the last time predictor. Well, how do you implement this? I think we've discussed this. So basically, let me go over this very quickly. But basically, this is what a BTB can look like. Uh, you have the address of the instruction, and you index into the BTB. And then you have the tag of the instruction. Uh, index means you index this memory, and you get a tag, and you compare the tag. If the tag matches, this means that you found the match for the program counter in this branch target buffer. And you have the target over here. And then you have one bit per branch saying, where, where did the branch go last time? And based on that, you calculate the next PC. That's one way of implementing this BTB memory. Right? You can think of it as instruction memory also. OK. So this is the state machine for last time prediction. You have two states for one bit, right? Uh, one state is predict taken state. This could be 1. And the other state is predict not taken. This could be encoded as 0. And if the branch is actually taken, you stay in that state. If the branch is actually not taken in the last execution, you go to the other state. And if the branch is actually not taken and you're in this state, you stay in this state. And if the branch is actually taken and you're in this state, you go to this other state. This is very simple, right? You guys can do this. Now the problem with this is with one different outcome, it changes its mind very quickly, right? That's the problem. You basically go to this predict taken state very, very quickly with just one single outcome. Maybe that's not a good idea with loop branches, right? Especially loops that are iterating relatively few times. Maybe just stick to your decision for a little bit, saying, oh, maybe the outcome I've seen is just a fluke, right? So that's the idea. A last time predictor changed this prediction from taken to not taken or not taken to taken too quickly. Even though the branch may be mostly taken or mostly not taken. Right? So the idea is to add the, you guys know the idea of hysteresis. Basically, think about it before you make your <laughs> change a little bit. Uh, basically, add hysteresis to the pr predictor such that the prediction does not change on a single different outcome. You stay for a while in that range. 
So basically, you change your threshold a little bit. For example, your temperature uh, controllers work this way. You set a temperature, target temperature. They don't kick in right away at that temperature. Otherwise, it oscillates. Right? They have a range. Beyond some range, they kick in. And if, if, if the temperature goes below that range, then they kick in. They don't have a single threshold. So that's what we're trying to somehow imitate over here. And how are we going to do that? Basically, use two bits to track the history of predictions for a branch instead of a single bit. Does that make sense? A single bit, you switch quickly. Two bits, you can switch more slowly. Now you can have two states for taken or not taken instead of one state for each. And this is actually another paper I would definitely recommend. <laughs> it's another seminal paper that introduced this two-bit counter prediction, which is actually used widely in many areas of computer architecture today. Because the idea is very simple. It's just two-bit counters. But it works very well, as it was shown here. OK. Basically, each branch is associated with two-bit counter. One more bit provides that hysteresis, which means that a strong prediction does not change with one single different outcome. Now, what do I mean by strong prediction? Uh, if you look at accuracy for a loop with n iterations, now you get n minus 1 divided by n. Let's take a look at this case. This is the extreme case over here. But uh, where is this thing? OK. If your prediction, if your loops are iterating a lot, that means that most of the time you're in the taken. You're, pr you're, you're predicting this taken. Now, if you have two-bit counters, this basically says you're strongly taken. I'll show you what that strongly taken means, because we have two states. When you fall through, you predict it as taken. The actual outcome is not taken, but you don't change your prediction for the next time. You still keep it as taken. You say, I've seen one outcome that's different from taken, but I've seen this taken many, many times. So I'm going to stick with taken for the next time and observe it again. So maybe you go to a weakly taken state, but you still predict it taken. And when you come back to this loop after a while, now you're correct, right? Because it's going to be taken again, assuming that this loop is going to iterate many times. So you only mispredict the loop exit branch, not the first time you enter the loop. That's why you have this n minus 1. Make sense? That's the beauty of two-bit counter prediction. You don't change your uh, decision so quickly. And with this, you're going to either stick with taken or not taken in this case. So you get 50% accuracy here. Now, this assumes that the counter is initialized to weakly taken. So we'll take a look at it. So the upside of this uh, compared to the one bit counter, well, one bit counter is kind of odd, right? A single bit last time prediction is better prediction accuracy. And 90% accuracy is not, um, not unreasonable for many programs with this kind of predictor. Now your CPI goes even lower, right? 1.04. The downside is now we have more hardware cost, two bits instead of one bits per branch. OK, this is the state machine for this. Basically, the counter actually uses saturating arithmetic. You guys know saturating arithmetic? Well, the, even the previous one actually used saturating arithmetic. Basically, you have maximum and minimum values. And you have a counter. If you add to the maximum value, you stay at the maximum value, right? Because it saturates at that point. If you subtract from the minimum value, then you stay at the minimum value. Otherwise, it's just like a counter. So basically, we have four states. I'll call this the taken states. And uh, these as the predicted not taken states. But this is strongly taken. You have you had a lot of evidence that the branch was taken. And uh, to get to the state, you, may, you, you should see the branch has taken many times. Right? And this is the state transition. It's, if you're in this state and the branch is actually taken, you go to a stronger state that you believe, if you will, the branch is going to be taken again. And then if you're in this state, and if you keep seeing the branch as uh, taken, then you stay in the state. If you're in this state, strongly taken state, and if the branch is actually not taken, then you don't change your mind, go to this state quickly. But you firstly go to this state. You still predict the taken the next time. But it's kind of weak, because now you're ready to change your mind if you see, that, see the branch is not taken again. Does that make sense? You could think of it as as changing your belief based on evidence, right? You need at least two differing outcomes to change your prediction. 
Okay? And you can do the same thing for the other states. You don't change your prediction to taken just by seeing uh, one outcome if you're in the state. Strong, if you're strongly believing that the branch should be predicted not taken, you change your decision only after two differing outcomes. Okay. Well, I think I've shown you this. You can take a look at that. Any questions? Everybody understands this concept, right? This is important. You can go through the state machines yourself. It's actually fun. You could make a three-bit state machine, right? You could make eight states. <laughs> then you change your belief even harder. Now there's a trade-off here. Maybe sometimes you actually should change it quickly, right? That's why the loop counter exists in some cases. Well, in some processors. OK, the question is, is this enough? We're complicating things. No, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good answer. Well, it depends. You didn't say it depends this time. <laughs> but actually, the answer is it depends. Depends on <laughs> where you are. <laughs> but basically, uh, you get 85 to 90% accuracy for many programs with this two-bit counter-based prediction. This is also called bimodal prediction. I don't like the name bimodal, uh, but two-bit counter prediction, let's say. Is this good enough? Well, it depends on how big the branch problem is for your processor. Maybe it's good enough if <coughs> CPI is 1.04, right? Maybe you don't want to optimize that. But if, 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 your CPI, if your branch penalty is 60 cycles, well, we have a problem, right? So let's take a look at that branch penalty. Uh, let's go through this exercise to see how big of a problem the branch uh, problem is. Assume that control flow instructions are, well, uh, this is not an assumption, but this is true in many programs. Control flow instructions are re relatively frequent. They're 15 to 25% of all instructions. The problem is next fetch address after control flow instruction is not determined after n cycles in a pipeline processor. Now let's, just, let's dissect this n a little bit. This is the minimum branch resolution latency. In Pentium 4, it was 20, actually 21 cycles, I think. Obviously, storing on a branch wastes instruction processing bandwidth. How much instruction processing bandwidth do you waste? Certainly, you lose n cycles, right, n instructions. But then you also have a wider pipeline. Basically, you have multiple pipelines in parallel such that you can fetch from multiple instructions. So you really waste n times w instruction slots. So for example, if your pipeline stage, uh, if, you, if the branch resolves after 21 cycles, and if you're fetching three instructions per cycle, you're losing, at a minimum, 63 instructions when you mispredict a branch, or when you stole in a branch. It's the same thing. That's a lot of instructions to lose. Right? And actually, existing machines are much worse than that. So how do you keep the pipeline full after a branch? Well, we've talked about this. But let's take a look at the importance of this. Assume a uh, five-wide superscalar pipeline. And I made it five so that we can compute this more easily. Five-wide means you're fetching five instructions per cycle with a 20-cycle branch resolution latency. The branch is resolved after 20 cycles, which means that you lose 20 cycles worth of instructions if you mispredicted the branch, which is not unreasonable in today's machines. The, key, the question I'm asking is, how long does it take to fetch 500 instructions in this machine, assuming one out of five instructions is a branch and they're uniformly distributed? Well, I haven't given you one information. What if your branch prediction is 100% accurate? How long does it take to fe uh, fetch 500 instructions in this machine? This is simple. <laughs> Say it again. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be perfect. It, I, mean, I don't think you sh could still get it into 100 instructions uh -huh. because like, you're 100 cycles. Five uh -huh. instructions. What if the branch was the first of those? Yeah, instructions? assume assume that it's all uniformly distributed on branch. Uh, yes. If the branch is always at the end of that. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so uh, but assume that it's so perfectly predicted, so it's nice. Okay. Yeah. So assume that you don't. Uh, br the branch is always aligned as the fifth instruction, and you don't have any waste in the fetch cycle. So you're you're getting ahead a little bit. I had something over there, saying maybe I'll cover this. I had something over there saying no fetch breaks. Fetch break means that branch is somehow in the middle, and you need to determine the ca uh, you need to figure out whether the next few instructions in the wide pipeline needs to be fetched. But let's not go into that right now. Let's assume that it's nice and smooth. And we're also assuming that we can determine 
if it's a branch yeah. and where it yes. would be going to and all of that within the cycle. Yes, you're... absolutely. We're, we're going to assume that. From now on, we're going to assume that. OK. 100. 100, right? <laughs> 100, because you're, you're basically uh, have 500 instructions, and you're fetching five instructions per cycle. You're 100% accurate. Nothing goes wrong. That means 500 divided by 5, right? And you don't waste anything. You don't waste any work. Now let's do the same thing for 99% accuracy. It's going to be fun now. <laughs> There's one mispredicted branch. That's right. Uh, so 20 times 5 went wrong. So is that 200 cycles? Not exactly. <laughs> you did the math wrong. You're at the right, you're at the right path, if you will. So you basically need to oh, fetch. Yes. Uh, so there's only one mispredicted branch. That's the realization, right? You have 500 instructions. Uh, and remember, one out of five is a branch, which means that you have 100 branches. And 99% of them are accurate, which means that you mispredict only one instruction. And only for that instruction, you fetch 20 cycles on the wrong path. That's wasted. Which means that you, need, you still need to fetch all of the 500 correct path instructions which takes 100 cycles. And the wrong path instructions take 20 cycles. So you take 120 cycles. So you've lost 20% performance, basically, even though your accuracy went down by only 1%. Terrible. Even worse, you get 20% extra instructions fetched, perhaps, right? Well, I don't know if it's even worse, but energy <laughs> is important. Right? How about 98%? Now you'll get the hang of it. <laughs> you just multiply this by 2, right? Because now you have two branches that are mispredicted. 140 cycles. 40% extra instructions fetched. 95%, which is pretty respectable still, right? 95%. Remember, 100 branches and 95% you're getting correct. It feels like magic. 95% must be good. Now you're up to 200 cycles. You're wasting half of the work that you're doing in the fetch engine. It sounds terrible, right? And you lost half of your performance. So that's the importance of the branch problem. That's why people have focused on this. That's why 95% is not enough. Make sense? <laughs> so this looks very high, but if your pipeline is deep and wide, it's not enough. Even a very little improvement in the branch prediction accuracy buys you a lot of performance and a lot of energy efficiency. OK, I'll stop here, and I'll ask you, can we do better in the next lecture? Try to read the McFarling paper, because that will help you a lot with the global and local branch prediction ideas, such that they won't sound like magic. <laughs>